Does the way that elections work in the United States guarantee a two-party system? Yes, but no. Well, it's kind of complicated. People like to characterize U.S. elections as being all about red versus blue, but the reality is is that there's actually a whole lot of, well, purple. As polling agencies like Gallup has shown us, the number of political independents has been rising in recent years, and may continue to do so after the drama of this election cycle. And while, yes, the number of true independents has been relatively stable over the last 50 years, the fact that people no longer want to identify themselves as party members tells us a lot. And as this image from the Facebook and Mashable collaboration shows us, people are taking their frustration with the current party system as an opportunity, as a catalyst, to investigate third party options. For every individual who's interested in third parties, there's at least one individual who believes that being so is irrational. We've all heard, or maybe even ourselves, express the argument that a third party vote is effectively a wasted vote. And while, yes, some of this can just be chalked up to political zealotry, the more rational-headed arguments tend to believe that this is an artifact of how we elect our officials in the United States. But is this really true? A huge focus is placed on the first-past-the-post election system. Colloquially referred to as winner-takes-all, this is the system that operates in every U.S. election. It basically means that whatever entity secures the majority of votes will win the election outright. Many argue that this intrinsically prevents multi-party representation. However, most of their ideas about first-past-the-post tend not to be too terribly nuanced. If I seem a bit bitter, it's honestly because I am. I can't tell you how many times I've seen comments in YouTube or on Facebook or gone into Reddit threads and seen that term, first past the post, used like as some sort of damn argumentative EMP powered by just pure smug. Multi-party system? Nope. First past the post. Ideological moderation? Nope, nope, nope. First past the post. Sending a man to Mars? You know, have you ever really considered the true effects of first past the post? Now, obviously that last one was a bit of a joke, but even the first two arguments have logical merit. Even if a loud plurality of commenters, you know, ignore it. But CGP Grey has a fantastic series of videos linked down in the doobly-doo as well as right here that goes through the argument, but I'll give the crux of it here. Let's say you have four candidates and they're trying to win ten votes. Three people like blue, three people like orange, two like purple, and two like yellow. As it stands now, blue or yellow is in the lead, but there are four viable candidates here. Except yellow supporters notice that there's no complementarity with blue. See that? That's an art joke. And as such, could not stand a blue presidency. So they abandon their candidates to support one that they can at least relate to. This pushes orange into first place. But purple supporters are then faced with a president that they don't like, so they abandon her to side with blue. Because they can at least have some similarities with blue, and that dastardly orange won't win. Even though there are four viable candidates, the mechanism encouraged people to abandon the smaller candidates to prevent having one that they dislike. But first past the post doesn't actually guarantee two-party representation, like just as an empirical fact. There are over 20 countries in the world with first past the post, and a significant number of them have more than just two parties represented in their legislature, so it's simply false to say that first past the post prohibits multiple parties from being in government. On the other hand, the United States actually has a quirk that many of these countries don't, and that's that we have what's called single member districts. As where other countries they have parties whom you vote for here, you vote for individual candidates, and this one-two punch actually does prove to be a sizable hurdle for third party inclusion. This brings us to another common argument against the viability of third parties in the United States, Duverger's Law. Its advocates basically make the same case as those who support First Past the Post do, except they aver that the addition of single-party districts effectively guarantees defensive voting. Well, I mean that and the fact that you do need to have over 50% of the Electoral College in order to secure the presidency. This is admittedly a really subtle addition, but it's an extremely consequential one, because it takes all of those schemes that other countries utilize to make their legislatures more representative and tosses them all out a window. Hence why advocates for Duverger's Law argue that it guarantees a two-party system. It seems pretty ironclad. Until you get to that whole pesky little notion of certainty. Because as it turns out, Duverger's Law has a huge asterisk attached to it. Political geography. And no, fortunately it's not the kind of political geography that forces you to memorize all the countries of the world. Because I'll be completely honest with you guys, I am terrible at that. I have been terrible at that since the Animaniac song was rendered obsolete in the mid to late 90s. United States, Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Peru, Republic, Dominican, Cuba, Caribbean, Greenland, El Salvador, too. Duverger's law is rendered less and less effective the smaller and smaller the population gets. And this is because it rests on the argument that it is impossible to effectively convince everybody to abandon the historical two-party trend. And this is true, admittedly, when you're dealing with a million people, but not so much when you're dealing with a hundred, or in the case of our earlier example, like ten, and you happen to know, like, half of them. 
The more local an election is, the more it's going to be decided by local circumstances. And these circumstances aren't always encapsulated neatly by the platforms of the two major parties, paving the way for the emergence of a local third party. And this isn't just a thought experiment. Researchers have shown that the number of third parties in both India and the United States tend to fluctuate with how centralized the government is. The more local government operates, the more third parties are there. And the more centralized the government is, the less there are. In fact, you can look at the diversity of parties on the state level in the United States on Wikipedia and find that they're actually fairly common. Not pidgey common, you know, possibly a Zubat or maybe even a Paris, but it certainly isn't like a Lapras. But unlike a Zubat, whose range of attack is small and largely ineffectual, these third parties can grow to actually have a huge national importance. And again, this isn't just a theoretical can. A look through American history has shown us that this has actually happened. You know the Freemasons are at the center of a lot of conspiracy theories these days? Well, it turns out that this disdain has been pretty constant throughout history. Back in the 1820s, New York was a pretty inhospitable environment for Freemasonry. Local religious organizations condemned the organization, and their ire ignited a political movement defined by many of the same complaints as today. You know, the whole idea of controlling the world and whatnot. In 1828, a number of local leaders ran for various political positions on the single issue of fighting against the subversion and subterfuge of democracy. And they won. But the attention that they garnered by starting out as local single-issue parties encouraged them to adopt other policy positions. This enabled them to spread into Ohio, Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Pennsylvania. In fact, Millard Fillmore got his start on the anti-Masonic ticket. If his name sounds vaguely familiar, it's because he later served as the 13th President of the United States. This wasn't the only time that a third party gained significant political clout in the United States. In the 1910s, the progressives, initially led by Teddy Roosevelt, gained a number of seats in Congress as well as in the state and local representative offices, and they impacted critical domestic policy for well over a decade. And although some people may look at this example with, you know, skepticism considering that it was over 100 years ago, the fact of the matter is, is that there is no statute of limitations on electoral trends or on civic engagement. Just because something hasn't happened for a while doesn't mean that it won't anymore. Does Duverger's law bias the United States to a two-party system? Absolutely, no question. And similarly, first-past-the-post is probably the worst system to employ if the end goal is to try to have a flourishing multi-party environment. But people will take these objective facts and inject a whole bunch of hyperbolic cynicism. They claim that it's impossible for a third party to win, that they quote-unquote never win. But a look through US history shows that we can have a more diverse representation when the United States citizens become inspired enough. That's what it all comes down to, the people. Whether you're inclined to vote Democrat in Texas, or Republican in California, or Green, Pirate, or Pizza, what have you, don't let anyone encourage you to believe that your support is illogical or wasted. Your voice has power. Your vote has power. And you'd be surprised at what that power could do if you use it. What do you guys think? How much does Duverger's law impact the current state of third parties in America? What other factors can you think of that either encourages or discourages third party mobilization? And why would having a third party be intrinsically better, or maybe even intrinsically worse, than having two? It's kind of a stated assumption within this video, but I think we need to question all of our assumptions, especially those that go unstated. Let me know down in the comments. I look forward to reading them and responding to a few of them in next week's office hours. Thanks for everything you can be found in the doobly-doo, and if you enjoyed this video, I hope you'll consider liking it and subscribing to the channel. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.